Good morning. In grace and peace, we gather in this place together as Christian people uh, to, to reawaken uh, to the presence of the one who is our living, loving God and to the presence of the one who calls all of us uh, to be co-creators of justice and love in this world. In the wake of the violence of the past weekend, the candles on the altar table this morning uh, continue to shine as a reminder of God's presence with all of us, a constant presence in which we can trust. God is with us. God is with the victims and the perpetrators of violence everywhere. God is with the communities who are left to wonder why. In which it's with a sure and certain hope in that constant presence of our living, loving God that we gather this morning uh, and that we come again to the waters of God's new creation.
Sisters and brothers in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of a new creation. It is through the sacrament of baptism that God's spirit claims us as part of the new creation, initiates us into Christ's body, the church, and entrusts us with God's ministry of reconciliation. This morning we come to the waters to remember that we are part of God's new creation and to renew our commitment to Christ who has raised us, to the spirit who has birthed us, and to the creator who's making all things new. Will you please stand? And so I ask you, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin. Will you allow the Spirit to use you as prophets to the powers that be? We accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Will you proclaim the gospel? and live as Christ's body here on earth. We confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, put our whole trust in Christ, and promise to serve Christ as Lord in union with the church. Christ is people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you be living witnesses to the gospel, individually and together, wherever you are, and in all that you do? faithful members of Christ's Holy Church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. Will you receive and proclaim the faith of the Church? We affirm and profess the faith of the Church as we put our trust in God, the three in one. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. He is so, and Savior. Almighty God, the life you birth in us by baptism into Christ will never die. Your justice never fails. Your mercy is everlasting. Your healing river flows. Your spirit flows where you will. We cannot stop you, God. But sometimes we try. We try to block the flow. We redirect the winds of the spirit, or we walk so far away from the life-giving stream that we do not hear its sound, and we forget its power. We parch ourselves. We are dry and thirsty, O oh God. Come, refresh us. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come upon these waters. Come upon these waters. Let these waters be to us drops of your mercy. Let these waters remind us of your righteousness and justice. Let these waters renew in us the resurrection power of Christ. Let these waters make us long for your peace and love. Most holy God, Abba, Father. Glory to you. Jesus Christ, Savior, Lord. Glory to you. Spirit of fire, spirit over the waters, spirit of holiness. Glory to you. Eternal God, one in three and three in one. All glory is yours, now and forever. Amen. During the next hymn, as water basins are carried toward your aisle and water is sprinkled across the rows, you are invited to remind those near you, remember that you are baptized and be thankful. When you have received your baptism reaffirmation, you may be seated. We will be singing down in the river as a seated congregation.
Our preacher this morning is uh, Bishop Peter Weaver. He's been a friend of mine since we were both elected bishop in the class of 1996 together. I was serving in South Indiana at the time and he was in Western Pennsylvania. And after we were elected, I was sent to the Minnesota area and Pete was sent to the Philadelphia area. And then after I came to East Ohio in 2004, he was assigned to the Boston area and oversaw the Methodist Church for all of New England area. Um, he served in several churches in Pittsburgh before he was elected and at the time of his election was serving at first uh, United Methodist Church over there, one of the prominent churches in Methodism. And informed me just yesterday that much of East Ohio was part of the O's at Pittsburgh Conference. And so we were part structurally uh, related to the Pittsburgh Conference long before East Ohio was formed. But because he was in Pittsburgh, I'm assuming that he's always been a Steelers fan <laughs> and a Pirates fan and a Penguin fan. But they don't play much basketball in Pittsburgh and after last night, hope springs eternal. So as uh, Bishop Peter Weaver speaks, I'm sure that he will have something on his heart for LeBron James and uh, the needs that we have over here spiritually. <laughs> bring, us, bring us a good word, good word. Uh, Bishop Weaver grew up in a parsonage family in Greenville, Pennsylvania and graduated from West Virginia Wesleyan. He received a Master's of Divinity degree. Here's somebody here from West Virginia Wesleyan. And then he uh, graduated from Drew uh, University and he's going to be a bishop in residence there starting this fall, I think. Um, he's also a, has a doctorate of theology from Boston University and uh, four different honorary degrees from different institutions. Um, bishop Weaver was um, president of the Council of Bishops, uh, and I think he was the first member of our class of 96 to, to be in its Council of Bishops president. So that shows that early in his uh, leadership of the Episcopal areas, that he was recognized by his peers as somebody who could work with bishops. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I mean, talk about a skill and, and a struggle, I think. But, uh, but he has served us well and has been a, a, a close friend for a long time. Over the last four years, he actually retired uh, after uh, 16 years, where I went the full uh, 20 years. But rather than uh, serving as an active bishop, he's actually been the executive secretary of the Council of Bishops which means he's like the chief operating officer. He's the one when the bishops meet and everybody goes home, he's the one who has to do all the paperwork and get ready for the next meeting. And in that position, he's represented the Council of Bishops to the Association of United Methodist Theological uh, Schools and knows a lot about theological education from that experience. Um, Pete and Linda live in Williamsburg and Linda's with us today. Linda, would you stand up so we can welcome you? Welcome uh, Mrs. Weaver. Linda is a massage therapist and occasionally in the Council of Bishops, some of us will have a little complaint or something and we say, Linda, are you free to help us out a little bit? So she's become a close friend of Elaine's as well. I would close by saying that uh, Pete's always been a close friend of mine because early on after about our first quadrennium as a bishop, we realized that if we didn't do some fun, it was gonna be hard being on the Council of Bishops. And we spent a lot of time in our left brain thinking. So. At some point, we found out that we both like music. He's more trained than I am. But uh, we started the Bishop's Band <laughs> after one quadrennium. And our first performance, uh, thanks to Ken Chalker, was at the 2000 General Conference in Cleveland. And we actually, our debut was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, the only problem is I'm still learning to play the guitar, but I plug stuff in that makes all these wow sounds, and he plays a trombone. <laughs> so, you know, every time uh, we get together, he wants to play some Sousa music, and I want to play some, uh, you know, Mick Jagger or something, or <laughs> Keith Richards. And, but we've gotten together, and that shows you how we cooperate so well. So, I was going to say this later, but those of you that are elected to the de delegation to jurisdictional conference, we really would like to have a saxophone player elected bishop. 
I welcome Pete Weaver, one of my close friends. I'm so glad he's here for my final conference at East Ohio. Welcome, Pete. Actually, we uh, actually we need a guitar uh, elected. <laughs> Good morning, East Ohio. What a joy to be with you. There's a great spirit moving in this place, and I come among you not, uh, not as a bishop so much, or even a trombone player, uh, <clears throat> but as one claiming the highest title that can be given to any of us, and that is the title of follower of Jesus. So uh, we are hearing the call of Jesus, and we are seeking for that way to follow, follow, follow. So I'm so grateful for John and Elaine and for their invitation to be here, uh, to be a part of this time when we are challenged to follow Jesus in new and creative and life-changing and world-changing ways. Amen. And to know that there are people like, uh, like all of you who are gathered here and, and beyond you, all of those in your congregations that have listened, listened for the call. Molly and Logan that were up here and Brother Perez that was up here last night and, and, and those of the bridge and, and those who've been to Liberia. And, and, and I know that some of them were in Brussels when the terrorist attacks happened there. And, and I followed the faithfulness of this annual conference. And, and the stories that aren't told are the stories of heart that have welled up in your congregations and in your communities because you have said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And your churches have become launching pads for ministry and mission because our primary identity is not as delegate to annual conference or lay leader or district superintendent or bishop, but our primary identity is in our baptism as followers of Jesus. We are what I'd like to say, folks on the way, up and out. Jesus is calling us out. And this morning I want to talk about what it means rooted in our baptism to be going into the water and then spiritually up and out. You want to go with me this morning? Then Thursday, uh, which after Bishop Palmer is done with you on Wednesday, <laughs> We'll settle down again, and, <laughs> and on Thursday, oh, you'll be a blessing, I know. On Thursday, after we've looked at our identity in baptism, our essential identity, then I want us to look at our missional identity, spiritual to the missional. And we'll be talking about Jesus calling us after up and out, out and about. So I'm a pretty simple preacher. Joy to be here with you today. Uh, as John said, uh, we uh, have been friends with the Hopkins for a, a wonderful long time. He announced the date that we were both elected bishops, which you'll recognize was in the last century. <laughs> And when you're first elected a bishop, we were a part of the class of 96, and you're called a baby bishop. Well, the century has changed, and we're now called the balding bishops. <laughs> Actually, the truth of the matter is that some of the old bishops whose eyesight is starting to go, uh, they would confuse John and me. <laughs> If I put my glasses, I don't have quite the same kind of glasses, but you know, uh, and they, they'd come up to me and they'd say, oh, Bishop Hopkins, your ideas are so bright and good. And I'd just say, thank you. <laughs> Always happy to be confused with Bishop Hopkins. And then to come here for the great celebration last night and, 
And to hear all of you know what is in Linda and my heart, that love for Elaine and John and for all they mean uh, to our lives and to the life of Christ. You know, and, and to think all the honors and, and to think they've named the Cleveland Airport, Hopkins Airport. <laughs> I mean, I, I just... In New England, when I left, why they named a, a parking space uh, by the conference center uh, in my name. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame gig, uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer actually said there were Methodists dancing at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We started out with Rock of Ages cleft for me at the Rock and Roll Hall. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, of course. We started out with a hymn, uh, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, and modulated into Rock Around the Clock. <laughs> but there is a rock that is greater than I. <laughs> and we stand on it here this day. That rock that is Jesus. Uh, the other reason I'm glad to be here this morning is uh, because of Ohio, of Ohio. Uh, I hope many, all of you have read uh, David McCullough's wonderful book on the Wright brothers. And uh, you know Orville and Wilbur's father was a bishop in one of the predecessor denominations of the United Methodist Church. And if you if you own a discipline and look in the, in the front pages of the discipline there, you'll see Milton Wright's name, their father. And Wilbur Wright says, uh, is quoted in that book as saying, if you want to succeed, you need to pick a good mother and a good father, <laughs> and then begin life in Ohio. And I almost did that, actually. Uh, I was born in Greenville, Pennsylvania. It's only about 10 miles over the border. And as John already indicated, for a long period of time, uh, in the 1800s, from 1825 to 1875, our conferences were basically one. It was called the Pittsburgh Conference, hoping you would all become Pittsburgh Steelers fans. <laughs> but <clears throat> that didn't happen. <laughs> but the conference ran from the Alleghenies, which was the major barrier to the more sophisticated folk in the East who did not have the courage to come west. <laughs> and all of us who were foolish enough to come west over the Alleghenies began to share the good news that even here on the frontier, Jesus is Savior. God is alive and well. And so it was fascinating, if you look at the history, it was fascinating that the earliest circuits after they came over the mountains, what eventually became our conference together of Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio, the earliest circuits were named after the rivers. The Ohio circuit, the Mahoning circuit, the Hawk Hawking Circuit. I understand it's now just called the Hawking River. But in those days, it was called the Hawk Hawking River. The Little Kanawha Circuit. The Monongahela Circuit. You, you're feeling the flow of the waters. Down to the river they went. The settlers and the circuit riders. I see the circuit riding bags are, are gone. Uh, he's undoubtedly out there someplace along a river sharing the good news of, of, of this, this living water that begins to immerse us and surround us. And, and just when we feel like we're going under for the last time, there is a buoyancy of the Spirit that gathers us up. There is a Savior who reaches his hand down just when we're beginning to sink to our lowest depths. And up we come, up and out. And it all started at a river called Jordan. And the oldest, we think, the oldest of the Gospels begins not with the birth narratives, 
It's not about the history of ancestry. But Mark begins his gospel in that first chapter, in the first verse. Let me read it for you. In the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, it happened and is written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Oh, man, a oh, long way back. Long way back. Look. I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice crying in the wilderness. What? Come on, you can cry it in the wilderness a little louder than that. A voice crying in the wilderness. Oh, they went down to the river to pray. Good Lord, show us the way. Prepare the way. There in the wilderness. John was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God. Wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. Now, John wore clothes made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. We're having that for lunch, by the way. <laughs> he announced, one stronger than I is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You know this story, don't you? <laughs> We've lived along the rivers. He will baptize you by the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. And while he was coming up out, yeah, that's what it actually says. When he was coming up out, say it with me, up out, up out. Jesus saw the heavens splitting open and the spirit like a dove coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven. Listen. You are my child, my beloved. And at once, the Spirit pushed Jesus out, out, out into the wilderness. Will you pray with me for a moment? We've come from the rivers, the streams of waters from your creation, into the wilderness of our world this day. We've come thirsting to know what it means to move like our ancestors did in, into those places where we experience your love and grace in ways that pull us up and out so that others might meet you around the rivers of East Ohio and might receive you as the one to give their lives that buoyancy, that joy, that peace, that hope, that love, that love that never stops flowing from the heart of God. So uh, be with us as we 
as we focus in on what it means to go up and out this day as your people, the Ohio Conference of the East about the rivers where thousands of baptisms in the name of Jesus out of the Wesleyan movement have been held for generations. May they happen again and again and again. In Jesus' name, amen. So the backdrop is the wilderness. The backdrop is the wilderness. No uh, comfortable pews, no carefully constructed walls. I said to, to John earlier, I said the, the interesting thing that Linda and I noticed, we happen to have a cottage at the other Chautauqua in New York State. And you know, these, all these Chautauquas are connected together and the, and, and, and the, the granddaddy of the Chautauquas there in, in New York, the amphitheater was built with, with open walls, just totally open. So everything that's happened, I mean, you hear all the noises and everything that's going on around you. And then for a number of years when I was in Philadelphia, while I was invited regularly every summer to preach at Ocean Grove, which is the Chautauqua on the Jersey Shore. And they have what they call the Great Auditorium that seats 10,000. And, and, and that was built a little av after the original uh, Chautauqua Amphitheater in New York. And they decided to put barn doors on it. Any of you who've been to Ocean Grove know that they've got barn doors so that it can be totally open, but then they can close the barn doors if a, if a real storm comes up. And then we get here to beautiful lakeside Chautauqua. And somehow they decided that they just build really solid walls <laughs> to wall it all out. <laughs> And yet you have come to this place that this place might be the launching pad back out because there is a wilderness of God's people and a world that is as ancient as the wildernesses of Isaiah and as contemporary as the ache of Sunday's massacre in Orlando. the wilderness of violence. We've seen it again in the, in, in the thick entanglement of that scene in Orlando, uh, uh, the, the, the wilderness of hatred, the wilderness of homophobia, the, the wilderness of religions perverted, the wilderness of pushing away our Muslim neighbors, the wilderness of, of trying to figure out how, to, how do we live together in, in a society where there are differences, real differences, but, but, but where there is a God who has created us all, has invited us all to splash in God's grace and love and peace and justice and hope and salvation. The wilderness where there is a hunger and a thirst for that. The wilderness where young people are asking, how can this happen? The wilderness where last night, again, in Paris, there was another shooting. The wilderness of, of our not being able to figure out what, what are the guns that we allow in people's hands and what are the ones we don't. The wilderness of violence, the, the, the wilderness of concern for those who, who are having having emotional and mental difficulties. Is there a way? Do you hear them crying in the wilderness? Is there a way of the Lord in the midst of this time, this wilderness, this wilderness? They came over the mountains, the Allegheny Mountains, the wilderness of the late 1700s. And the first circuit, one of the first circuits was called the Ohio Circuit, named for the Ohio River. Uh, by one accounting, it had about uh, 12 points of preaching on it. They didn't just do that on Sunday, you understood. See, the wilderness of life, of our hearts, of our relationships, 
the wilderness is, is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, so, so the circuit riders, those early worn bags are worn out because they were preaching every day, every morning, sometimes two or three times a day, up and down the rivers. And then when somebody said, yes, I want to follow Jesus, they were down to the river and they baptized that person. And that person went on to tell some other person, my, my, let me tell you about Jesus. You get the flow of it in the wilderness. The church was not about building buildings or, or, or raising budgets. The church was about raising the spirit of those who were feeling down and out and, and yearned to be up and out. The, the, it, was not about, it was not about doing legislation, about organization. It, it, it was about doing preaching sharing evangelism am i allowed to use that word here yeah. okay not in terms of organizational life but in terms of relational life with jesus christ and with your neighbor and long before there were any church buildings to worry about or any uh or any budgets to raise people had come across into the wilderness with this extraordinary good news of Jesus Christ, life transformed, the world transformed. Telling the story of one who went down to the river. I suspect he prayed on the way to the Jordan. And there he met John, a voice in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And what happened there in that river? I want to suggest this morning was the movement, the movement that keeps moving among us, even to this day when we're, when we're down at the river of our core identity of our baptism. It's the movement that revives the soul again. It is the movement that revives the church again. It's the movement that can transform the world again. It's what I call the bodacious, baptizing, beloved movement of God's Spirit in our midst. Bodacious, baptizing, beloved people. Just say that with me, bodacious, baptized, beloved. The heavens opened. The movement began with a, of the spirit began with a, with a, a heaven splitting vision of what could be. It was like heaven and earth got connected. It was like thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was, it was like there was a vision of a new creation, the, the text theme for this annual conference. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a what? Bodacious, unbelievable. When you look in the dictionary, bodacious means it means bold and audacious. I, I, I would translate that a little bit to be bold, in its vision, and to use Wesleyan theology, not as audacious as assured. It's, it's that blessed assurance. It's that blessed confidence that God wants to connect all of the vision and hope for earth with heaven so that God's will might be done here on earth even as it is in heaven, and that connects at the beginning of this baptism scene that as Jesus comes up and out, he sees that bodacious vision of what yet can be. The heavens open up. Have you seen God's vision? Has the heaven split open for you to capture a bodacious vision for your own life and calling and your church's life? Oh, this is not little stuff, sisters and brothers. And that Ohio circuit, get this, started in 17... 78, and most of us weren't here then. 
except John and me. We were, we were baby bishops then. 1778. Twelve years later, by 1799, and, and the, the Journal of 1800 said there were 1,600 Methodists on the Ohio circuit. Just those 12 or so preaching places. Now, if my, if my arithmetic is right, that's about 100 new, not members, but baptized, yes, I want to follow Jesus, followers, disciples, who then became members. Now, how are you doing? A hundred every year for 12 years went from nothing to 1600 by 1812 that Ohio circuit had been transformed with a few other circuits and tied in into the Ohio conference an earlier manifestation of the Ohio conference and by 1812 12 years later from 1600, they had 36,000 folks who'd been down to the river. Mark says they came because they wanted their hearts and their lives changed. Have you been there? Have you been there? Have you had a... Have you had a bodacious vision from God that comes from heaven that says you don't have to be the way you are. Sin and depression and, and sense of purposelessness no longer needs to, to drag you down and out. There is a Savior who comes in his own life to show us the movement of what it means to move into the waters of baptism and then up, up and out towards that grand gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ, both now and for eternity. 36,000 plus in another 12 years. My, my. I saw that movement in a, uh, a woman by the name, I'm going to call her name Joyce. I, I was blessed to serve the oldest church in Pittsburgh of any denomination uh, for 11 years. It was my longest pastorate. It's right in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, those of you who know the Golden Triangle. Um, uh, Smithfield Street Church, it was founded in 1782 before anybody would have dared to cross the Ohio into this northern, northwestern territory <laughs> much. Uh, that congregation had been there for 200 and some years by the time I got there as pastor. We celebrated their 200th anniversary. They had once been a 2,000 member church. The Smithfield Street building, church building that's uh, still there, built in 1923, is seven stories of what was called an institutional church building, bowling alleys, gymnasiums, you know, dozens of rooms. Uh, the trustees informed me when I got there, they had 22 bathrooms. <laughs> My first Sunday there, there were 40 in church. They had everything but people. And uh, so we began to pray right there at the confluence of the Monongahela and the Allegheny, the creeks, the Ohio. <laughs> we began to pray. We had a year of prayer about what God would do. What was our mission? Who were we? What was our essential identity? Oh, we had our history we were proud of. They had all kinds of things they were proud of. They had a building that people came on tour buses to see. But what was our identity? What did God have had in mind for us here and now? Have you ever asked that question in your congregation? 
Down there in the river, between those rivers, we began to pray about it. You know how God is? God, God says, well, just open your eyes because the heavens have already opened. There they were, right in front of our church, flowing back and forth. Women, prostitutes, some of them teenagers that have run away, many of them older women who were addicted with drugs or had been thrown out by their relatives who couldn't handle their mental illnesses. There they were, right on our front steps. What's on your front steps? What's up and down the road near you? What's, what's, what's down by the river? Who's sleeping under the bridge? Where is there wilderness right on your own front step or in your own congregation that needs the movement of the bodacious, baptizing, beloved-making Savior Jesus Christ? Well, we'll call her name Joy. She, she'd been on the streets of Pittsburgh for three years. She'd been beaten up. She'd been abused in every way you can imagine. She was, by her own description, down and out. That congregation decided to open that big old building. Nobody else was there. <laughs> and welcome not just into the building 24-7, but to welcome into the little life of that dying congregation. There had actually been a book written entitled What's Ahead for Old First Church. Hundred downtown churches had been examined all across America. Some of you remember Ezra Earl Jones' name. He wrote the book. He is, Smithfield Street was one of those. He predicted it would be closed within 10 years. I was appointed there seven years into that 10-year period. <laughs> But the most important thing was that there were praying people there. And there was Jesus who'd been down to the river where the heavens opened and where the baptizing Holy Spirit came down. Beloved, every child of mine is beloved. Those on the street on your steps those in the broken homes down the street, those who are the LGBT, those who are the poor, who are living under the bridges, those who are the, those in the corporate headquarters who are yearning for some new sense of who they are and where God is calling them to be. And so that congregation welcomed anybody and everybody, including those women who happened to be homeless but beloved by God. Joy said to me one day after the service, she said, Pete, for the first time in my life, I know that I am loved. She said, uh, I've gotten a new, a new vision of what I can be. Bodacious. This woman who had been beaten up and left for nothing. I've got a new vision. She said, every morning when I come in here, I sometimes come in here smelly and angry about life, but somebody comes over to me and says, you know, Joyce, I love you and God loves you. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, I know you normally take your shower before you go to church on Sunday. You don't come smelly in that way, but there's smelly stuff inside. You're angry about it, so you try to cover it up, all dressed up. Yes, we do that. We come to annual conference all dressed up. And then somebody comes over and sees the hurt and the pain in your eyes and says, you know, we love you. God loves you. It's like a whisper from heaven. The possibilities open up. In that baptizing moment, the Holy Spirit begins to take you and lead you to a new place. And Joyce said, you know, I don't think I've ever been baptized. Would you, would you baptize me some Sunday? I said, sure, Joyce. So we set the Sunday that she was to be baptized. She came in her best blue jeans and T-shirt. 
And when it came to the point in the service, she came down the center aisle to a huge baptismal fount that's in the front of that sanctuary, carved out of one piece of Italian marble. It was done in Italy. It was brought over. It's uh, one of the things they come intricately carved to see on these tour buses. It has a huge bronze uh, uh, top. It takes two ushers to lift it and take it off ceremoniously whenever we did, did baptisms there. Well, we had sort of weak ushers in that church, but they, they'd come down, they'd take that off, and, and then, they, then they'd, they'd pour into that baptismal fount of water, probably from the Ohio River. <laughs> water. as a symbol of not just water, but of the Holy Spirit that comes in baptism with transforming power. And I asked Joyce, standing at that baptismal fount, the question that's been asked along the rivers of East Ohio, the Mahoning, the Shenango, all those circuits, the Little Kanawha. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And the question just sort of hung out there in the silence as if it were the most important question in the world. But then, sisters and brothers, it is the most important question in the world. For anyone who's crying in the wilderness, for anyone who's feeling homeless, oh, oh, you or your neighbors may have big homes or lots of stuff stuffed in the closets, but you know what I mean. Finding that place of unconditional love where you are embraced, where you are given a new future, where you are given a new creation. When Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, it's almost the image of being in the water and then up and out into new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. It is bodacious for your life and mine and for this world, for this nation on this day that we gather here. It is the most important question in the world for any of us who represent Jesus in our communities and want to invite people down to the river to pray and find the good Lord's way. And Joyce began to answer, yes, 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 yes. I hope you can't stop answering yes. I hope with every piece of legislation that comes before this annual conference, you'll measure it against the yes of welcoming persons into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you'll measure it against the yes for ways in which to share the good news that is bodacious and life-changing uh, here in East Ohio and in your community. I hope there will be a yes in every vote that you take for Jesus, for he is the one who is calling us up and out to be the church that welcomes people up and out. And so I baptized Joyce, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, water pouring down over her. She was almost virtually dancing, and then she turned around and, and started back to center aisle, and, and, and then all of a sudden she turned around and she said, Pete, do you mind if I sing something for you? And, and I had to pause for a moment because like a lot of churches, we had a bulletin. It was all timed out and all... <laughs> You know, I saw where Joyce was supposed to be baptized. Some of the folks in the congregation were already looking at their watches, just like you are right now. <laughs> the other thing you need to know about that church is that like a lot of downtown churches across America, they'd had nothing but paid professional singers provide the music. They didn't even have a choir loft. They had a loft for a double quartet, paid big bucks, just like the choir here this morning. But sometimes we can let the Holy Spirit move in the United Methodist Church, amen? amen? Sometimes God is more bodacious than we are. I didn't, then I realized I didn't even know if Joyce could sing. <laughs> but I said, sure, Joyce, come and sing for us. And so she came down to the Steinway Concert Grand Piano sits in front of that empty sanctuary, <laughs> nearly empty in those days. She put her rough, hewn fingers on the keys 
bearing the scars of wilderness and began to play and to sing because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future then life is worth a living just because he Someday I'll tell you the rest of the story of that transformed life that went on to transform life after life after life. She was marching in the light of God, in the life of God, a bodacious, baptized, beloved of Jesus. What's your core identity? Remember, you are baptized. Be thankful. Amen. starting to get into it now. <laughs> and I'm going to suggest that this last time we say it, we are marching up and out with God. We are marching up and out with God. Are you ready? Here we go. We are Yeah. 
And so, brothers and sisters, let us gather at the river. Let us splash in the buoyancy of God's love and grace. Let us know that we are called by Jesus who was baptized to go and proclaim the good, bodacious, baptizing, beloving news that God loves you, me, this wilderness world. Let us go in that confidence and peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. amen.